And welcome. Thank you all for coming. Uh, I'm delighted to introduce today's speaker is Philip Nickel, um, who uh, works at the University of Eindhoven in a group um, with a lot of expertise on social, political, ethical implications of technology, and uh, who himself has done a, a lot of work on testimony and related issues to do with trust, which is what he's going to speak to us about today. Let me just say a word. I can see that the audience here is extremely interdisciplinary. So let me just say a word about uh, norms. Um, we'll try and keep any substantive questions to the end. Uh, but if you have clarificatory questions, then raise your hand uh, in Zoom and uh, we'll try and address those as we go along, but leave substantial questions to the end. Great. So if you're ready, uh, Philip, over to you. Thanks a lot. I'm not always so good at reading questions in the chat um, while I'm speaking. So um, somebody might flag for me if there's a um, question that pops up in the chat that could be useful. So, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, thanks very much for inviting me. Um, this has given me a chance to work out some ideas um, that have been very helpful to me uh, on some projects I'm working on recently. So I really appreciate the opportunity to present these to you. And I would um, very much like to hear any feedback from the various disciplines um, about my ideas. Uh, the title of the talk is Trust, Discretion, and, and AI. Um, I've been working on the topic of trust and trust in technology for 10 or 15 years. And um, with the recent developments in the field of AI, and also the advent of a new AI institute on my own campus at my own home university, uh, I've been sort of increasingly attempting to um, apply things I've worked out in relation to trust in technology to um, trust in AI. And I'll try to um, discuss some of the most recent things I've worked out um, in the first part of the talk today. Um, just a little advertisement. So a project that I've started with recently is called the Ethics of Socially Disruptive Technologies. It's uh, funded by the Dutch government. And it's a collaboration between five universities in the Netherlands, the four technical universities plus Utrecht University. So there's a lot of people involved in this and it's a 10 year project. And uh, some of the work that I do is on disruptive innovation. And that does relate to what I'm talking about today because the particular angle on disruption that I take is that technologies can disrupt people's moral expectations and cause them to, be, to have moral uncertainty, uh, which undermines their own ability to to act as moral agents. Uh, so I try to develop that uh, in a couple of publications that you see here. I'm also involved in a project on mobile support systems for behavior change, looking at how technologies influence people to behave more healthfully or to use energy better. Um, and uh, then there's my work on trust in technology that I've been doing for a long time. Uh, just to get uh, warmed up, uh, I have a few things to say by way of introduction. Uh, trust and trustworthiness are um, big business. In the EU, trustworthiness of AI is a brand. Uh, the EU is trying to develop trustworthiness as a, a kind of a brand identification for AI that's done within the EU and EU universities. And they've developed this assessment tool for measuring if your organization's AI is trustworthy. Uh, in the middle, you see a picture from the website of IBM Watson, where they say ethics is at the core. Trustworthy AI has three ethical principles at, at its core. And then they highlight what those are. First, that the purpose of AI is to augment human intelligence. Second, that data and insights belong to their creator. And third, that new technology and AI systems must be transparent and explainable. And on the right, uh, there you see a report on the future of AI and digital healthcare that appeared in the Financial Times recently, where the authors Ilona Kickbush and Anurag Agarwal write that we need to build public trust in digital technologies through stronger protection of rights threatened by extensive data extraction and digital surveillance. <clears throat> 
that requires greater public participation in decision making and design and in the accountability of governments in the private sector. It needs a greater emphasis on public consultations, the systematic adoption of open data strategies and the development of oversight and redress mechanisms. So in various ways and in sometimes contradictory ways, uh, there's the idea that somehow we should test and standardize trust and trustworthiness in AI. And uh, something I'm trying to do in this talk is to figure out what trust in AI amounts to. Uh, there's a revival of um, interest in trust in philosophy about 40 years ago uh, with the work of Annette Beyer, who's pictured here. She's a New Zealand philosopher who worked on the philosopher, uh, the historical philosopher David Hume. Uh, but she also did some pioneering work on trust and the ethics of trust. And I uh, rely heavily on some of the key ideas from her work in uh, what I'm talking about here. In particular, she linked the idea of trust with discretion and vulnerability. So when you trust somebody, you give them discretion and you become vulnerable to them. Here you see a quote from one of her pioneering papers. She writes that to understand the moral risks of trust, it is important to see the special sort of vulnerability and introduces. Yet the discretionary element, which introduces this special danger, is essential to that which trust as at its best makes possible. To elaborate Hume, it is impossible to separate the chance of good from the risk of ill. So people make themselves vulnerable, interesting, and this involves this discretionary element that I'm gonna be talking about. So the talk has three parts. The first, I go into the relationship between discretion and AI and ask whether there's a trade-off between using AI within a professional sphere and the discretion of professionals. Secondly, uh, I go on to talk about whether it's possible to trust AI at all. And then in the last part of the talk, I ask whether AI practitioners and AI itself can exercise discretion, which would be a condition on it being trusted. There's a long and interesting history, an extensive discussion of discretion in the philosophy of law. Um, here you see a quote by the philosopher of law, uh, H.L.A. Hart. It's one of the most important um, legal philosophers in the 20th century. He's talking about what discretion amounts to in the law. And so I start with the law because um, this is where the theory of discretion was developed so much during the 20th century. And I think it also provides an interesting case study for looking at how AI might be used in a way that affected legal discretion. So Hart writes, when we're considering the use of discretion in the law, we are considering its use by officials who are holding a responsible public office. It is therefore understood that if what officials are to do is not rigidly determined by specific rules, but a choice is left to them, they will choose responsibly, having regard to their office and not indulge fancy or mere whim, though it of course may be that the system fails to provide a remedy if they do indulge their whim. If we think of this kind of discretion as being a problem, um, then uh, the law is a good place to, to try to think about what that problem might consist of. Some uh, Canadian writers uh, in a journal called uh, Canadian Journal of Law and Society uh, wrote a it's kind of an overview of um, the puzzle of discretion talking about this problem. And they say, where discretion is constructed as a problem usually expressed in terms of arbitrariness, solutions are most frequently sought through the development and application of even more legal rules to constrain, shape, and guide the use of discretion. This view also reflects the conceit that discretion can be eliminated and that legal rules, when not framed in discretionary terms, are somehow self-executing. So if um, judges or law enforcement officers are being arbitrary, um, one impulse that we might have is to sharpen the rules. And I think it's the same impulse that might lead us to try to put, um, to help AI to support the decisions of judges or law enforcement. Um, and the question then of this talk is whether by doing that, we're actually reducing 
the professional discretion of judges, for example. Judges do um, have significant biases in their professional judgments. Um, here is a quote by two legal authors, Wistrich and Ruchlinski, writing about how unconscious influences on judgment uh, can trump careful deliberation. Uh, stepping into the quote, they say, an increasing body of research indicates that people have two distinctive styles of decision-making, intuitive and deliberative. Intuitive decision-making consists of relying on one's first instinct. Intuition is emotional. It relies on close associations and rapid, shallow cognitive processing. Intuitively, if a choice sounds right and feels right, then it is the right choice. Psychologists sometimes refer to the style of decision-making as system one reasoning. And these authors argue that this system one reasoning is very frequently influential on judicial decision-making. An example they give has to do with, um, well, a kind of peculiar bias. They say, they give a, a case in which, I don't know if you can identify these two um, US states. They're relatively close to, to Canada. Um, the one on the left is Wisconsin and the one on the right is Minnesota. I drew these myself based on a map. So I'm to create a little bit of a folksy home, homely air to the, the slide. The, the example is one in which judges in Minnesota were asked to assess a hypothetical case involving a business that began dumping hazardous chemicals in a nearby lake on private land so as to avoid the cost of proper disposal. The activity of polluting the lake injured the landowner after he went swimming in the lake just after the business owner dumped some dangerous chemicals. The materials indicated that the parties had settled on an amount for compensatory damages, but the injured plaintiff was seeking punitive damages. They also asked the judges whether they would award punitive damages, and if so, how much. For half the judges, the materials indicated that both the plaintiff and the defendant were in-state residents from Minnesota. And for the other half, the plaintiff was a Minnesotan, but the defendant was from Wisconsin. The judges expressed a large in-state bias. The median award against the Minnesota defendant was $1 million, but the median award against the Wisconsin defendant was $1,750,000. There were similar but smaller effects in New Jersey and in Pennsylvania and Ohio with Michigan as the foreign jurisdiction. So in these kinds of um, experiments with uh, hypothetical situations, judges exhibit um, unmotivated bias in their decision-making about punitive damages, for example. So you might think that um, this would be an area where we could actually use technology to help judges to be more consistent. And the question is then whether there might be a role for AI here. This is an old quote from a work by Ackrich. Uh, he's well known for developing a theory of technology as creating scripts for users. And the quote here just says, many of the choices made by designers can be seen as decisions about what should be delegated to a machine and what should be left to the initiative of human actors. This suggests that there's a trade-off between uh, the decision-making that we delegate to a machine and what professionals uh, judge within their discretion. So we could actually equally just cancel out the word initiative and put in the word discretion here. I don't think anything is um, particularly lost. So the idea that by using AI that we're reducing professional discretion is what I'd like to focus on. And I wanna use a example that's close to home. So uh, every year my faculty teaches the same introductory engineering ethics course with the same assignments to over a thousand students. And students submit their work online and they receive a grade in comments. So suppose that we decided to streamline the grading and make it more consistent by using AI to recommend grades and comments to instructors based on past data. The question then is, has the teacher's discretion been reduced? So in order to try to get a handle on this question, I've developed a little visual model based on an analogy that um, comes from Ronald Dworkin, a legal philosopher 
also a very famous legal philosopher from the 20th century. Uh, here you see his book, Taking Rights Seriously, which this is from. Um, he has an analogy for discretion that where it's kind of like the empty space in a donut, where the donut represents actions that are impermissible according to the evidence plus the rules of the evidence that's provided plus the, the legal rules. Um, and the, the hole in the donut represents an area in which discretion is, professional discretion is used by judges where their judgments are permissible or indeterminate according to um, evidence plus rules. So they're, they've got a space in which there's no rules that apply and that's where discretion um, operates. So I start with this simple picture, but it's a little bit weird because if you just think about it as an empty space and we just think, well, the judges could just decide anything within that space and it's just fine. Well, that's not really the way it works. So the, I mean, the donut represents the, the space where the rules plus the evidence create a very clear decision that have to be made. But the space in the middle is one in which some other kind of judgment is operating. So it's not just completely arbitrary what they do in that space. Um, and this is the space of discretion. So I define discretion as a kind of pragmatic authority in a domain to answer questions that are settled by um, pragmatic as well as evidential factors. This authority is fixed by legitimized expertise and social rule. So it's partly a matter of the norms that you've internalized, but also what you can get away with institutionally. And to come back to the example that I gave, for example, I mean, there are some grades that I could give to students that would be absolutely ruled out because the student would complain. And then, uh, you know, the examination committee at my university would look into it and they would judge in favor of the student. Um, so there are some things that are absolutely ruled out and that's sort of what you see in the, the donut, the, that those things are not part of my prof professorial discretion. Um, but on the other hand, yeah, I mean, I do have quite a bit of latitude in what grade I give to a given piece of work, given the evidence. So the evidence is partly settled by evidence, but it's partly settled by pragmatic factors. The answer is somewhat conventional or answering a given way solves an important coordination problem. Like we wanna be consistent between instructors or between different sections of the course or where answering a given way communicates something important. Like I'm trying to improve, you know, get students to, to work harder. So these pragmatic factors are also at stake where, um, where we're talking about discretion. So it's probably better to think of the donut as having a kind of a jelly center where that is um, involves this pragmatic authority rather than just being an empty space in which I can do whatever I want to. Okay, so suppose that we use AI in the way that I um, was imagining and that it blocks me from giving certain kinds of grades. So I, you know, I want to give a, um, you know, a six to a student, uh, but the AI suggests a much higher grade and the administrative situation and my discussions with my colleagues, are, it's such that I can't get away with assigning the lower grade. In that case, my, the discretion that I might've had before has been blocked through the deployment of um, AI. Um, and so, uh, that would be a clear case in which there was a trade-off. So in case, in this case, which I label case one, I'm gonna say, yes, there's a necessary trade-off. However, oftentimes the AI will just recommend action, but it can be overridden effectively within the institutional context. Um, this is discussed explicitly in the law where um, there are cases where uh, AI, has been suggested to help judges make um, better judgments, more consistent judgments. And uh, the authors Fagan and Levmore discuss various reasons why judges should be given the um, right to override. Uh, however, I mean, I think that because of uh, people's tendency to want to avoid responsibility and also maybe something like automation bias, their tendency to follow recommendations that are given by automated systems, the degree to which um, they still have discretion may be limited. So in this case, I think that we could say cautious no, but I think we would equally be correct to say 
a cautious yes, that there is a trade-off between using AI and um, the exercise of professional discretion. A third possible use is where the AI is deployed just to block people from doing things that are that they might be tempted to do. So maybe I'm tempted to, um, you know, to give students that I like higher grades, and the AI notices that and blocks me from doing that in an area that wouldn't have really been part of my discretion anyway. Um, so that would be one way in which you could use AI that would not actually trade off against discretion. So we call that case three and we say no in that case, there's no trade off there. And then uh, finally, there's the case where the AI just recommends action that would normally be outside of my area of discretion. Um, the sociologist Brain discusses this in the case of policing. She did a study of the LAPD and how they were using um, sort of big data based uh, recommendations for scoring risk of um, people. And so the police officers were actually using these recommendations to expand the scope of their discretion. They were using them as a justification, for example, for detaining somebody that they otherwise would maybe not have chosen to detain. So it actually operated to expand the, the zone of their discretion. So in this case, clearly, no, there's not a necessary trade-off. Um, but uh, that's different, very different from the grading case that I was talking about before. Okay, so uh, just to conclude then, in cases one and two, AI reduces professional discretion. In case two, it was just to some degree. In case three and four, oh, in case three, it doesn't, but in case four, it actually seems to possibly increase professional discretion. So given that, tr that trust includes discretion inherently, discretion is part of the trust relationship, what are the implications for trust? First of all, AI can reduce professional discretion and by extension, the relevance of trust in professionals. Um, in, we should particularly look out for that if we're using it in the way of, by way of cases one and two, but it doesn't have to. And secondly, the choice of how to embed decision support in professional practice is crucial to preserve trust in professionals to the same degree. Because if we're removing professional discretion, we're also re reducing the degree to which trust um, is vested in them, and instead replacing that potentially with trust in AI. And that's why I want to talk about whether AI is even a possible object of trust. So that's what I move to now in the presentation. I do see there's an item in the chat, but I, oh, just a welcome from Aaron. Okay, so part two, I raised the question, is it possible to trust AI? Here's a simple picture of how trust in um, technological artifacts works. You have some users, you have a technology like a robot, and then you have an engineer. And the users don't interact with the engineer directly in most cases, they interact with the technology and it's the direct object of their trust. But one way or another, that trust traces back to the engineer. Okay, so that's a simple picture. The technology is the direct object of trust. It's the thing that people rely on. You know, I rely on my car to start. I rely on a care robot to pick somebody up. Um, but this, these things that I rely on it on ultimately trace back to an engineer and I trust them indirectly, even though I've never met them and don't know exactly who they are probably. Um, if we look at the case of AI, it's a little more complicated when we're involving professional users, because um, for example, if it's a doctor, you have some patients who are relying on the doctor um, and then also relying potentially on a, an AI application. The doctor is relying on the AI application as a professional. And then you have this indirect relationship to what I call an AI practitioner. And that's just my label for um, the various people who are involved in designing and deploying an AI, a total AI solution for a practical context. 
Um, so it's really, I mean, so, so far I've been focusing on the way in which there could be a trade-off between the trust that one has in the professional and the trust that's vested in the, in the technology, in this case, the AI application. And that could be the trust of lay users or it could be the trust of other professionals, but it also involves potentially the trust that the professional has in the AI application as well. So um, yeah, I mean, I'm pretty warm to the idea that people can trust um, technology and AI, um, but that's not the most uh, a common position in philosophy. Uh, engineering in particular in the, in the design of AI, in, a, in design of artificial intelligence, uh, there's a kind of reflexiveness which has evolved over the last you know, 30 or 40 years where people actually try to design in ways that invite the trust of users. And I think that that creates additional responsibilities for uh, people who design and deploy um, artificial intelligence for professional contexts because they're actually inviting professional trust and also uh, lay users trust. And this is why thinking about whether trust even makes sense to talk about in relation to AI applications is important. If we look at a picture like this, it seems pretty clear that we can trust AI. I mean, at least it seems intuitive to me that the people in the picture are engaging in such trust. Um, but the question philosophically is whether these are the kinds of thing, robots here. I mean, but then let's just imagine that they're being operated using some um, AI algorithms. Then the question is, is that even the kind of thing that can really be the, the property bearer of the, the things that we take on when we trust? So, I mean, it's fine to trust another human being because they have moral agency. They're able to be responsive to the fact that I'm relying on them. But um, is that sufficiently true or even true at all for uh, things like robots and, and artificial intelligence uh, applications? So we have to look a little beyond the appearances. Here's an example of um, you know, how you might use social cues to invite people's trust instead of presenting things in a purely digital way, you could create an avatar or even some look, create some sort of a human looking thing to interact uh, in the interface with the user. Um, and that's the sort of thing that you would do in order to invite people's trust explicitly, part of this reflexive um, trend in, in engineering and um, technology design. But again, looking beyond the appearances, Actually, most philosophers say that trust in technology cannot be taken seriously. And to the extent that it can, it should be discouraged. Um, practitioners, people who actually work on AI or on human technology interaction, they are pretty comfortable talking about trust in technology. Um, and they think it's useful for talking about how people relate to technology, um, but they're not very philosophical or committed about what that means. So it's not as if they're making some big statement about the world when they talk about trust in technology in that way. They just do it because I guess it's um, you know convenient way to talk about the, the way that people rely on, on technology. And when you actually dig into the philosophical literature, you, cite, you see argument after argument that trust is not an appropriate attitude to have towards artificial intelligence or technology in general. So here's a, a quote from a book by two philosophers writing about trust in medicine. They say, from the fact that trust is relational, it follows that we can only trust in persons and indirectly through representatives and in institutions, but not in technology. Uh, here's two more quotes from recent articles talking specifically about AI. The first one uh, is, uh, to say that one can trust an AI system or that the AI is trustworthy is merely to say that one can rely on the AI system or that the system is reliable. Yet as we have seen, reliability is insufficient to generate a relation of trust under any of its philosophical notions, which all require characteristics essential and exclusive to beings with a form of agency. So this is extremely skeptical of the idea that we could trust an AI system. And in the second quote, we see 
while AI meets all of the requirements of the rational account of trust, it will be shown that this is not ult ultimately a type of trust at all, but is instead a form of reliance. Even complex machines such as AI should not be viewed as trustworthy as this undermines the value of interpersonal trust, anthropomorphizes AI, and diverts responsibility from those develop developing and using them. So not only is it wrong in itself, but it also leads to bad consequences if we um, trust AI. And for this reason, we need powerful arguments to shift the burden of proof toward accepting a notion of genuine trust in AI. And that's why I'm looking at um, discretion so closely, because I think that that's one of the ingredients in such an argument. So unlike many other philosophers, I think that it does make sense to talk about trust in AI. Here's a little table with some of the hallmarks of trustworthiness as it's understood in the philosophical literature. So one of the hallmarks of trust trustworthiness, for example, is that trust involves attributing goodwill to the trusted entity, that it involves attributing moral motivations or shared values to them. Uh, and the second line is another uh, characteristic that's often seen as being a hallmark of trustworthiness, that it's a meaningful object of blame and resentment, resentment when one is betrayed. So um, with regard to a human, these hallmarks of trustworthiness often make sense. With regard to a technological system like a robot, they don't really make sense. It doesn't make sense to attribute goodwill, moral motivations, shared values to a robot. It doesn't make sense to blame them or resent them if they um, do something against their function. And similarly then the idea is that an AI application just isn't the kind of thing that can have these characteristics. Therefore talking about trust is not useful or explanatory. However, when we get to some of the hallmarks of trustworthiness that have been argued for in the literature, it does seem to me that they can be possessed by uh, technological systems in context. So if we talk about the fact that we give discretion, discretionary authority over answering certain questions to artificial intelligence, and that we thereby make ourselves vulnerable in a way um, to errors that could result, um, this seems to be quite characteristic of trust. And furthermore, it's often said that Trust involves having normative expectations toward the object of trust. So if I trust something, I think it's supposed to do certain things. Um, if I trust someone to be a, you know, a responsible uh, course instructor, then I think that they should assign grades after having actually read the papers of students in their courses, that they should be consistent and so on. So I hold those humans to normative expectations. Similarly, I think when we know what a technological artifact, especially a complex one, is for, like a robot, a care robot is meant to lift somebody, then if it fails to do that, we think it's done something that's wrong in a certain sense. So it's failed. Um, now, it, it, does, it may not make sense to blame it, but it clearly has done something that violates a norm. We could trace that back to the AI practitioner or the designer if, you know, if we're talking about that kind of rely, reliance on, on artificial intelligence. But if I, um, for example, if I'm working as a human resources professional and I rely on AI to screen applicants for me, um, then I trust it in a way, in, in the sense that I think that for answering questions of which applicants can be screened out, it's gonna give me a correct answer or a correct recommendation and I thereby make myself vulnerable to it. Uh, furthermore, I think that it's supposed to be able to do those things. So the reason why I make myself vulnerable to it and give it this authority is because I have certain expectations about the functioning of such an algorithm. Hence, for these trustworthiness um, characteristics, I think it does make sense to, um, to talk about trust in AI. And I think that they're explanatory. So that's the first of the arguments that I normally put forward against the trust skeptic that some of the hallmarks of trust do make sense when applied to technology. That's why I've continued to work on this idea of discretion, because I think that that 
to, to see the way in which AI and AI practitioners take over discretion from professionals shows that they're operating in the space of trust. Uh, but a second argument I give is that people engage in a distinctive mode of interaction with technology that resembles trust, and this is explanatory. So it also shifts the burden of proof against the trust skeptic. And finally, trust toward technology must remain a concern in design because it's linked to other values like privacy. So if I trust, um, if I trust an app that's collecting data on me, for example, then um, that actually affects what we consider to be a violation of my privacy when I'm freely giving it access to certain kinds of data, but not others. If it actually uses that data, then even though somebody may come to know something about me as a result, that doesn't violate my privacy in the same way uh, because of my attitude of trust compared with a situation where I don't trust the technology. Um, and uh, in that case, then it could violate my privacy to collect the same data. So I think that because of these linkages, um, trust toward technology is also explanatory on, a, um, on an ethical, um, on the ethical side. So those are the main arguments that I gave against this um, trust skeptic. All right, so that wraps up the second part of the talk where I ask, is it possible to trust AI? And my answer here is yes. It may not be quite the same as trust in humans, but it's explanatory. Um, it helps us to understand uh, the ethics of, of privacy, for example. And um, it also helps us to understand what's going on when people in, when designers of artificial intelligence, when designers of algorithms, where they're actually put into a context and they're supposed to answer questions that people really have, how the invitation to trust them creates moral obligations uh, on behalf of the uh, AI practitioners. All right, so this brings me to the last part of the talk, which is about whether AI practitioners and AI itself can exercise discretion. And I think that by now you may have guessed my answer to that question, which is also yes. So if we look back at what discretion is, I defined it as a kind of authority in the domain to answer questions that are settled by pragmatic as well as evidential factors. This authority is fixed by legitimized expertise and social role. Uh, just to review again, an answer is partly settled by pragmatic factors when available evidence does not fully determine the answer and the answer is somewhat conventional or answering a given way solves an important coordination problem or answering a given way communicates something important. The idea is that, um, for example, when uh, AI takes over or re makes recommendations to me, to go back to the example, for example, in the grading situation, where it suggests that I give somebody a, an eight and it suggests that I use, that I make certain comments in response to the text analysis that are performed, for example then um, I'm taking that to be based on the evidence, but not fully based on the evidence. I know that there are other factors which go into determining the answer to, to the question of what grade somebody deserves, which have to do with consistency across teachers and across sections, uh, with have, which have to do with communicating the importance of knowing certain points to students or even helping certain students to improve. Um, and so uh, those questions, are partly settled by the, um, the application, the AI application in this case. So that's what I mean by it taking over discretion. Um, and so I think the idea is that um, AI practitioners should be aware of the fact that they are settling certain conventional questions as well as responding to evidence in some cases when discretion enters the, the when they're using artificial intelligence to support or in other ways affect the, the professional discretion that somebody might otherwise exercise, whether it's in the legal domain, the educational domain, or the medical domain. To just see this visually, to go back to our cases, here the discretion of the AI practitioner is operating where in the space where the discretion of the professional is blocked. So the discretion of the professional is reduced and the assumption is that since that's a discretionary area, the discretion must be exercised somehow. Um, and so it makes sense to attribute it to the AI 
or to the AI practitioner indirectly. In the case where the um, artificial intelligence is making recommendations, so it, instead of just blocking me from giving a six to a given student, it's um, just making a recommendation that I give the student a, you know, a 7.5 or something, um, then I may be inclined to go along with that because I don't wanna spend the time to evaluate the situation myself or to, to do the work necessary to override it. I might just be um, over-trusting. So I may, I may have some automation bias and be more inclined to, to follow things that computers tell me. If the computer says no, then I, then I agree. Um, and in that case, then uh, knowing that the person who designs that and implements it shares discretion with me within the, the space of possible um, uh, the exercise of judgment about the grade. So in this case as well, the answer is yes. But of course, in the um, cases three and four, the, there's not the same kind of trade-off. All right, so I've tried to answer all the questions that I posed. Um, there is a necessary trade-off in case one and probably in case two between professional discretion and the discretion exercised by artificial intelligence. It is possible to trust artificial intelligence and AI practitioners are exercising discretion in some cases when they um, deploy artificial intelligence in the sphere of professional discretion and decision-making. And that's it for, for my talk for now. Great, thank you very much indeed. So let me just remind people in the audience, especially philosophical people in the audience, that time is relatively tight. So keep questions briefer than you might in a normal philosophical context. Uh, if you do want to ask a question, raise your hand either actually or virtually, and I will call upon you. There was one question in the chat, maybe we should start with that, that was asking whether you're conceiving of AI here in a way that's limited by its current capabilities or whether you think something similar would be said of future Wizier AI. Um, I'm, I'm considering in its current capabilities, uh, but I'm, I mean, I'm happy to, to consider what would be the case if AI became more, um, more capable of uh, con considering multiple aspects of a situation, you know, you know, taking into account some aspects of general intelligence. Um, that's interesting. I think it just enhances the case that I want to make for trust and discretion. Sylvia. Thanks. Um, yeah, so can we go back to part one? Um, and I'm, I'm an outsider to this. So could I like, could you tell us more about algorithms and what they're doing in order to get us to the case four scenario? Um, so, you know, I have somewhat particularist intuitions, but what I'm hearing you suggesting here with the idea that the algorithm might potentially suggest a case that would normally be outside of the norms, um, but that might actually be that exception that would have gotten overlooked and therefore might be a case for discretionary judgment, that what the algorithm is doing better than I might be doing or better than the rule governed system might be doing is picking out the the sort of the um, important factors from the sort of messy whole. Um, can you tell me more about why that case four is plausible? Um, so I was, um, at first I didn't think about that case at all. Um, I just was only thinking about the idea that AI would come, come in and kind of give me recommendations that reduced my own discretionary decision-making. Mm -hmm. But then I read this article about how um, the use of um, algorithms and big data within a policing context gave officers an additional license to do things that they might not have done before. So they may have ruled out like, you know, that as an option within their discretionary decision making before, but the use of the AI actually empowered them to be to exercise more discretion in context. Um, so I, you know, I, I don't have 
I haven't thought thought it through much more than that, other than to find the, to to try to distinguish it as a possible case. But what I what's a little bit funny about it is that if these if this zone wasn't within their discretion before, the whole idea that somehow the implementation of um, artificial intelligence could expand the scope of what they would be permitted to to judge it's as if well how does that happen wouldn't they have already been permitted to do that originally um but my thought is that happens institutionally so because the ai comes into the picture it actually changes the boundaries of what people can get away with as professionals so it changes and expands in this case the zone of their discretion can i follow up it, it, I'll leave it to the I, chair. Yes. Well, he's not telling me not to. So um, <laughs> I need to know more about why. I mean, what's the philosophical analysis of what the algorithm is doing that makes that possible, makes that plausible? Um, is it somehow um, doing a better job than the rules would normally um than the rule govern regime of picking out the thing that makes the exception. I'm just trying to locate this, these phenomena within the space of trust. So um, I'm, I, ha I haven't really been thinking of it in terms of it doing a better or worse job, but more adopting the sociologist's point of view that it's simply changing the boundaries of what somebody can get away with as a professional in context. So, um, the idea that it can affect that suggests that it's taking over some roles that are characteristic of trust. That's the, the picture that I wanted to put forward. Can I, I think, ask a somewhat related question about the relationship between discretion here and explicability? So is the idea that when the AI is exercising its discretion, it falls, it doesn't just go into the donut bit because it's not just implementing some codifiable rule. So insofar as explicability means it can provide a general principle under which its decision making falls. Does that then cease to count as discretion in your on your account of what, what discretion requires? Um, so Dworkin makes a distinction between the rules which govern the space within the donut and then the space inside is governed by what he calls principles and policies, where those require judgment. Policies are about the achievement of goals and principles are about the implementation of broad values like um, fairness or um, yeah, like the degree to which something resembles precedent. There are these, you know, legal principles that operate that are independent of the achieve that are somehow separate from the achievement of goals and not identical to the application of clear legal rules. Um, so I think this is helpful, but I think that the explicability could operate on on different levels of explanation. If there were a clear rule at stake, then the explication of why a given action was not permissible according to the AI would, would be, hopefully, um, we would make reference to the, the rule. I don't know exactly what that explanation would look like in relation to principles and policies, but it would be different. So it would be like, um, yeah, like whether something was in accordance with judicial precedent. Um, you know, what kind of explication, what kind of explanation would be needed there? This case resemble according to the algorithm. This case resembles previous cases um, in a way that is analogous to other, you know, previous instances where precedent has governed something that fell on the boundary line. I don't know exactly how how that would go. Um, not sure if that really answers your question. I'm just trying to think through what. Yeah, the it can, so it's, it the. The initial setup you related like the human exercise of discretion to type one versus type two thinking, right? System one versus system two yeah. thinking, where humans aren't gonna, I mean, and if you ask someone, why did you make that decision rather than this one when it was within your, the scope of your discretion to go either way, I guess they are likely to produce things like precedents. But those are likely to be confabulations, right? It's, it's the answer really is going to be something more like, well, it felt right to me. Like I like the look of him. Uh, yeah, 
yeah so the explicability is yeah it's harder to secure yeah i mean so i think when we got into it may be helpful in the future for me to zero in on some more concrete contexts where these issues could be worked out in more detail i mean i think it probably would be profitable to use that general framework but then apply it to some decision make professional decision making in medicine or some specific legal context and try to work out what explicability would be um, in the different cases because i think it would look a little bit different if it had to do with sort of the understood rules of the situation that everybody accepts versus the domain of judgment that the professional normally exercises i feel like the explanation that would be involved would be different for those two regions of the um the diagram if that were true that would be nice it would be an additional um sort of theoretical bonus of the the, the visual model that i um, mm -hmm. put in There's plenty of people here who have excellent expertise on these topics. Please don't be shy. Raise your hand or sing out. Neil Martin has raised his hand. Um, yeah, I have a question um, about the division between AI systems and the AI practitioners. Uh, the perspective I'm taking is that isn't the AI practitioner actually a part of the AI system in the sense that the AI needs to gather data, needs to formulate a model or something, and then make decisions. So when somebody trusts the use of an AI system, the application or whatever is just the, in some sense, the user interface that they're interacting with. The actual system making the decision is that piece of code or application, plus the uh, AI practitioners, plus even the people who um, set up the training data, so who uh, generated the data that the AI system learned on. So I'm sort of wondering, uh, is trying to isolate the AI system to a specific application or robot actually uh, a misleading approach in the sense that that's not actually the intelligence. The intelligence is the collection of application practitioner and the data generators. Okay, yeah, I think that's a really interesting question. Um, I mean, I mean, it's a very enlightened view, actually. I think about what uh, what the technology consists of in that case to regard it as a socio technical system that includes the designers and so on. It's just, I think that a lot of that is not what somebody imagines they're interacting with in the in context. So the actual thing they, if they see that somebody has a risk score of 25 and, you know, and that's, that's, um, that's marked as red. Uh, and so that means that the person needs to be given a special intervention of some kind to prevent, for example, in a medical context to prevent them from being readmitted to a hospital. Um, the discretion is given to the this thing, and, and perhaps it is a bit in, indeterminate what it is to, to answer a question that matters to the professional in context. So it's, that's the discretionary authority that's granted. Is that being granted to this socio-technical system in the broadest sense? Um, I don't think that that's the that's not the concrete object of the attitude of the person who has trust in that case. They may sort of dimly be aware of those, but I would see that as a, a more indirect relationship. I'll have to think about that more because it, I think it is a it's a nice way of thinking about the technology as a, a you know an extended socio technical system. Well, I guess that to me the application isn't necessarily intelligent. It may just be sort of an exotic filter and the intelligence is actually the whole process of generating that filter so even though the end user is only interacting with the application itself uh, when you're thinking about trust and trust of intelligence you really have to be careful about what actually is the intelligence that you are trying to evaluate the trust well, would, in, even though the end user may not 
I think I might think about it in terms of what what thing bears the function within the context. So the, there are certain functional expectations that the user expects the technology to live up to. Um, you know, to to have to have better patient outcomes on a whole, for example, in the case that I was talking about, or to you know to reach some patients who would otherwise be missed for special interventions and to reduce the overall readmission rate. If it doesn't, if the algorithm doesn't manage that, or if the the AI application doesn't manage that, then it's failing in some sense. Um, so, which what thing is the bearer of that function? Is it that socio technical system in the broadest sense, or is it something more limited than that? Okay, that's thank how, you. Yeah, that's how I would settle it. If no one else wants to come in, I'm going to sneak in one more on my own behalf. I do see a talk a uh, question from Scott Anderson. I'm not sure if that's... Oh, he left the room. Oh, okay. Um, I, I think he was Got just... Uh, he was... So his question is about trust and this contrast between trust and merely reliable predictability. Yeah. I see Your that. argument there turned on this notion of our relation, well, it didn't turn on, but included this idea that our relationship with AI involves privacy in a way that our relationship with just relying on the trains to run on time doesn't. So can you expand on that a bit more? Um, the thought is that if you, tr if you really trust, um, and if you trust an application to give you answers to something that matters, and you're thereby willing to share, for example, a lot more data with it as a result, then the use of that data for um, aims that are essentially related to the function that you ascribe to it don't violate your privacy in the same way as if you um, shared strategically. So if I just shared because I didn't have very good options, um, I'm just trying it out for the first time, or I just want to have one functionality, but in order to get that, I have to give away a data, bunch of data related to other functionalities. I think that the same uses of the data would count as a privacy violation in that case, compared with the one in which I'm engaging in, a, in an attitude of trust. So the fact that this distinction between something's being a privacy violation or not, it's just a data flow, but to dis that distinction seems to depend on the attitude of trust I have toward the the system. Hence, we need to talk about trust in order to explain the normative relationship that I enter into with the system. That's the, so, the structure of the argument. We're a bit tight. So, so, so take a system that's that's not an AI at all. It's just like a just a hard drive on which I happen to store all my personal data. My relationship to that is not trust. That's mere reliability. All it's supposed to do is to, to store your data. It's not yep. performing any functions that are data dependent, you know, that somehow depend on the specifics of the data that you share with it. So that, that would be a case of just reliability rather than trust yeah. in that system. Well, I mean, I'm actually okay with trust in a more limited sense, but it's just not trust in a sense that relates to the, the content of the data that's shared. Whereas if you're sharing a lot of data in order to achieve better outcomes, um, and you really care about those outcomes because it matters to you functionally, um, and it depends on the content of the data, then I would think that, that um, it, you know, if it's being used in various ways and even shared that doesn't for those purposes, then it doesn't necessarily count as a privacy violation. Whereas if you were just relying on it strategically in the ways I was mentioning, then it might. So what counts as a privacy Violation depends on the attitude of trust that you enter into with the um, the service, and if it's AI driven, then of course it will involve um, artificial intelligence. But I see. I don't know. Yeah, it's I, I find it a complicated thing to explain, but I feel there's something there. Um, yeah. So the the what the system is doing with it is itself constrained by the content of it in the yeah. AI case. Whereas what? Yeah. No. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah. That brings us to the end of our hour. So if, unless anyone's got a question that takes no time, then I think I'll thank you all for coming very much and thank again our excellent speaker, uh, Philip Nichol.